Okay, we are back and welcome back to all the wonderful students in the Nutrition for Food Technology course at Niagara College. We are starting our journey into generating nutrition facts tables and many of the students who are in the food technology program at Niagara College want to be product developers. Well, we have to understand the regulatory basis for generating nutrition facts tables in that uh, there's a lot of rules. There's a lot of regulations. There's a lot of um, reasons why we do things. And so we are going to delve a little bit into this. If you if you haven't watched the video on the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, do watch that first because we will be referring back and forth um, within this video to that document. But uh, we're going to start it. Um, let's start making some nutrition facts tables and carry on from our process of um, documenting recipes so that we can give the information that's necessary for us to make nutrition decisions about our product. So at the end of this video, you'll discuss which products require nutrition facts tables. You'll also identify which products are prohibited, exempted, or accepted from nutrition labeling. So what on earth do I mean? Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that nuance between prohibition, exemption, and exception in a moment. You'll also notice I'm going to flip back and forth between nutrition facts tables, nutrition labeling, and NFTs. And I mean the same thing. NFT is a nutrition facts table. And you will discuss how labels can be generated by chemical analysis or database generation. We're not going to do all of the chemical analyses, but I want you to understand that there are two main ways that nutrition labels are generated, either by chemical analysis or using a computer database. And we'll debate the considerations why industries allowed so much variation within the labels. And I have another series of videos on nutrition label compliance that we'll, we'll visit at a later point. But it's surprising just how much leeway people have within these labels, especially the industry. But there's reasons behind that. So... As I mentioned before, you need to have visited the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, and we have a different video, and so do, do take a moment to watch that video before jumping too far ahead. And in there, I say, go and use Google. Google to find this. I will share the link for this in the um, YouTube video that I'm sharing, but I highly recommend that you just start getting in the practice of Googling Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, and get into that habit of looking things up fresh every single time to verify that you have your regulations down. I've been in this business for uh, about 20 years and I still look stuff up fresh every single time because the rules and regulations keep changing and I need to make sure that I am getting the most up-to-date information. And so we will be uh, accessing this document as part of our, um, as part of our journey in this video. So most foods need nutrition facts tables. And if you have a consumer packaged good, when I say consumer packaged good, I mean a product that you're typically going to be finding in the grocery store. That packaged good in general needs a nutrition facts table. And it has some key pieces of information. This is a standard format nutrition facts table, but we've got our net weight. We've got our, so this is not our net weight, but our serving weight. So 125 mils of this product is 87 grams. Um, we've got our calorie count. Now, a calorie count is going to be, um, actually, in general, it is a contribution of how much is contributed by the fat. You would have taken this in your previous nutrition course. Fat's contributing uh, 9 calories per gram. Um, carbohydrates are contributing 4 calories per gram, except in the case of dietary fiber, at 0 calories per gram. Uh, sugar is 4 calories per gram, protein is 4 calories per gram, and we don't see it on a nutrition facts table, but ethanol is going to contribute 7 calories per gram. And some of these nutrients as product developers, we want to be focused on um, increasing them because they have value from a marketing perspective as well as from a um, nutrition, health, and wellness perspective. I can't, I can't stress just how important the two uh, features of marketing and advertising are alongside the nutrition, health, and wellness piece of this. Of of this, 
honestly, the two are intertwined. And so uh, we talked about this when we, when we had the video about trends and science, the two intertwine. So many times product development teams are linked with regulatory teams. Other times product development teams are linked with marketing and advertising. And so they'll be able, uh, they'll want to be able to go out and say, Hey, you know what? This product has all these wonderful uh, health attributes. We want to be able to um, have a front of label claim on this product. And you as a product developer will need to develop that product so that you can match that front of label claim uh, capability. Some of these you want to decrease. So fat, saturated or trans, cholesterol, sodium, carbohydrate, and sugars in general were decreasing, while fiber, protein, and vitamins and minerals we were trying to increase. Now you may have said, wait a second, there are other things that are missing on this nutrition facts table. And we will delve into that at a later point, but this is a standard format nutrition facts table. And depending on what you are claiming on your product, let's say I had a front of label claim saying, this is a product that has a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. Now, because we have that label claim, that would show up as a voluntary nutrient within the nutrition facts table. So let's jump into those terms prohibited, exempted, and accepted with uh, within uh, the requirement for having a nutrition facts table. Some foods are prohibited. And I put foods in quotation marks because under the food and drugs regulation, these are not technically foods. They are um, other products that have food-like characteristics. So liquid diets that you might be receiving in a hospital through tube feeding or infant formulas, foods with infant formulas in them, meal replacements, nutritional supplements. So I think pills or vitamins or or so on. The foods that are used in very low energy diets, cannabis edibles, and natural health products. These are all not technically foods. And so while you may see information that looks like nutrition, um, and it, it is nutrition information, but it is not a regulated nutrition facts table as per the Food and Drugs Regulation. There are um, there are separate regulations for these different classes of products, and I'm not going to be covering those in this class. But I want you to be aware, for example, of lots of uh, graduates from this program who've gone on into the cannabis industry, and they'll say, well, can I use the, can I use the database approach to generating a, nu a nutrition facts table for my cannabis product? I'm like, it is not a nutrition facts table, but you can use a similar approach for understanding the contribution of different uh, nutrients to the, the nutrition information that's required on this product. So it's not a food. It's not a food. Let's clarify that one more time. It is not a food. Anything that's in this list is not a food and therefore it does not require an NFT. It's actually prohibited from having an NFT. Uh, there are foods that are exempt from having an NFT. And so fresh fruits and vegetables and herbs, you likely have gone and bought apples at the grocery store or whatever. And in general, they do not have nutrition facts tables on them. Prepackaged single portion foods served in restaurants. So let's say you went to a restaurant and then ordered, um, I don't know, you, you ordered bacon, eggs and toast and they bring out a packet of ketchup, a little packet of butter and a packet of jam. Each of those little tiny single portions of foods is exempted from having an NFT. Milk products. You may be scratching your head saying, wait a second, I have a carton of milk and it has a nutrition facts table. Technically it's exempt, but in many cases they will take advantage of the fact that this is information that consumers want. And so you can be exempt from something, but then have a voluntary label. And so that's a weird and wonderful space. And I, again, I recommend that you take a look at the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry to delve into that further. There are products where the label is just too small. Think about packages of gum or um, rolls of candy. Sometimes the package size is just too, too small for the a uh, nutrition facts table to be able to be accommodated. And so are, there are some exemptions where it doesn't have to be on the label, but instead it has to be available through another accessible means. So for example, if you were to call the company or uh, who, who calls a company anymore, you look, at, you look them up online, 
you would be able to find the nutrition facts elsewhere, but not on the label. And uh, another exemption is one bite confectionery items. So things like hard candies or um, gummies or single chocolates, if they are just one in a package and it in, in theory could be put in your mouth and that's it without having to bite it or lick it, then that's considered a one bite confectionery item and it's exempted from a nutrition facts table as well. Some products are exempt. And when I, when I say exempt, this has the word usually tied with it. So, for example, bottled water or vinegar, foods that have zero in all of the columns of the NFT are usually exempt. And again, that doesn't stop companies from putting a voluntary NFT on, on the package, but they are usually exempt. So think spices is another good example. Alcoholic beverages. If it has an alcohol uh, uh, greater than 0.5% alcohol by volume, ABV stands for alcohol by volume, in general, it is exempt. Now, there are certain alcoholic beverages that have nutrition facts tables. And that often, let's think of light beer, for example. Because they are out there promoting the low-calorie nature or the low-carbohydrate nature of that product, the moment that they make a uh, nutrition-related claim, they are required to have a nutrition label on that product. Other ones, uh, single-ingredient meats, single-ingredient fish as long as it's raw. So if you're buying a steak at the grocery store, it does not require a nutrition facts table. Now that said, prepackaged ground beef, if it's not packaged at the retail, requires a nutrition facts label because ground beef can have extremely variable amounts of fat within it. Things that are prepared and processed at the same establishment. So for example, in-store grocery, uh, bakery, um, there's... There's a requirement for that um, bakery in general, it's able to have an exemption, but there's lots of ways to lose the exemption. And again, I want people to refer back to the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, but I want to um, just uh, represent the information here at a very high level. Now, farmers markets, farm stands, um, farm gate sales, Small, um, these sorts of small businesses are allowed to be exempt, and there are bylaws within the uh, municipal space that allow for small businesses to be able to make food products, and they are exempt from nutrition labeling. That said, we're seeing more and more small businesses like farmers market vendors putting nutrition facts tables, and as you as you figure out how to make them you may realize that it's not as onerous as it sounds and it's a piece of information that's quite uh, quite valued by customers. Foods that are intended for immediate consumption, so restaurants in general, are exempt. But that said, we've mentioned that we're talking about federal law. In Ontario, where Niagara College is located, there is what's called the Ontario Healthy Menus Act and it has required restaurants that have more than, I believe the number is five outlets to have nutrition facts tables on file. It's either five or 20, and I'm, I'm pulling a blank right now. The Ontario Healthy Menus Act has indicated that uh, chain restaurants with multiple units have to have nutrition facts tables available to the consumer. So products that are intended for immediate consumption, such as you would find in a restaurant, generally are exempt, except that if there's additional regulation such as the Ontario Healthy Menus Act, then it adds and, and it adds the requirement for an NFT. Last but not least, if it's repacked and sold at retail, such as if you are buying cheese at a deli counter, or if you are buying bulk, um, I don't know, bulk trail mix at a bulk store, or if the label is less than 200 centimeters square, so uh, 10 by 20 in total on that label size, 200, centim 200 centimeters square, then it's exempt from requiring a nutrition facts table. If you have a big, huge label on that product, then, oh, you may need to have a nutrition facts table. When in doubt, generate a nutrition facts table because in a few moments, you'll see it is not that difficult to generate them. And for most types of products, it's, it's pretty straightforward to generate. 
there are reasons why you can lose an exemption for having an NFT. So sometimes if um, you'll have food products where you've added vitamins or minerals, and the moment that you intentionally add fortification, you have to have a nutrition facts table. If you are putting artificial or non-nutritive sweeteners, so let's say I want to put stevia, or I want to put erythritol, or I want to put... Um, oh, well, why am I having... I'm having a Sunday afternoon moment here. Asulfame K or aspartame into my product. The moment I have a non-nutritive sweetener in there, I have to have a nutrition facts table. If there are nutrition or label claims on that product, so if I say, this is a low-calorie beer... Beer, as we noted before, should be exempt from requiring a nutrition facts table, but the moment I say it's low calorie, 70 calories per can, I have to have a nutrition facts table. Or maybe it's, what's another example? Maybe I am selling a case of tiny oranges, and I say, oranges are a good source of vitamin C. Now I have to have a nutrition facts table. Because I went out and said uh, a nutritional attribute of this product, oranges are a good source of vitamin C. Because I stated that, I have to have a nutrition facts table. And this is one of the catch-22 issues about fruits and vegetables, is that the moment that you make any sort of health claim, you have to prompt all of this nutrition labeling, and that adds to the burden of labeling on that product. Last but not least, if it is ground meat or poultry and not packaged at retail... It has to have an NFT on it. So how are these NFTs made? Well, it's it's kind of funny to think, but so often uh, food companies say, well, I need to send my product out for chemical analysis. And in many cases, that is absolutely true. Many of these uh, nutrition facts tables are generated by sending out representative samples of that product and they're then analyzed for fat, for protein, for carbohydrates, for fiber, for the different vitamins and minerals. And that's fantastic. It's also very expensive. In Canada, the general uh, price for a complete nutrition facts table by chemical analysis is running around $1,200 to $1,800 um, per product. And Imagine you've got a company that's making a dozen products that can start to add up as an extremely high cost. Instead, what we've noticed is that for most food products, the variation on that product is reasonably low. And when I, when I say reasonably low, you're going to laugh because uh, in a moment I'm going to tell you how much variation that it is. For most food products, a plus or minus of 20%. Because of that variation that we allow in our food products, instead, more often, companies are using computer databases to calculate and estimate an appropriate nutrition facts table. And as we start to generate these nutrition facts tables um, using database, we'll notice that there are some exemptions and you uh, some types of products that you should never run on a database. But if you are more or less mixing a bunch of ingredients together and the constituent ingredients don't foundationally change a huge amount during the production of your product, database works really, really well. And so it will save a lot of money because you're not uh, having to do about $1,500 worth of chemical analysis. Instead, you're taking some time on a computer, plugging in your, your formulation, setting your appropriate serving size, you click a button and the basics of your NFT are in front of you. So the thing is, there are some compliance requirements. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency, I give you this link and I'll put this link in the YouTube video um, um, info box so that you can click through and find this link. I, uh, some students have been saying, well, it's not fair. There's links in the video and we can't click through. I try and make sure that they're always available for you in the in the uh, text box that's describing the video. Um, but in this case, it's the nutrition facts compliance testing requirements for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And they say they do not judge whether a product is made by a computer database or by chemical analysis. What they want to know is that it is representational, factual, and true. And so 
the thing is, they also realize that there's a lot of considerations at play. So if if you are making a product, let's say let's say you're at a soup company and you're making carrot soup, and you are harvesting carrots, and it is September and it is the peak season for fresh carrots. If you are harvesting those carrots in September, you have optimal nutrition quality in that carrot. And now let's say you're that same soup company and you are making carrot soup and it is April and you have had those carrots in cold storage for six, seven months. The nutritional quality inevitably has declined, but the key question is, do you have to send it out for reanalysis? Maybe you're making meat pies and you've got different meat cuts coming in and there's slightly different amounts of fat and protein and moisture in the meat every time. Did the cow that you have harvested and um, preparing the beef from, did it eat grass? Did it eat grain rations? Did uh, All sorts of different variations that can be occurring. Same with any commodity, really. There's natural variation that occurs in the quality of those raw ingredients and that natural variation then accumulates into the nutrition facts table. So often as consumers, we think of these nutrition facts tables as absolutely, absolutely true to form and that if I'm eating this product and it says it has 100 calories per serving, I am getting exactly 100 calories per serving. The thing is that there's, there's some variation that occurs in that nutrition facts table. It's not fair to industry to require them to retest every single batch of product that they're making. It's just not economically feasible, especially for small business. As as we mentioned before, if that small business has to send, one, send it out for chemical analysis every single time, and the, the, the sum of the chemical analyses costs about $1,500, if you had to do that every single time, it would add to the cost of your food product considerably. And given that most companies in Canada are smaller companies, that cost of analysis every time is going to add up. And so it's not fair to companies to require them to test and retest. And then if you think about it, they would have to also send out that uh, packaging material for adjustment every single time. And you wouldn't be able to have the bulk discounts of being able to order in I don't know, we were talking about making carrot soup in just, just a few minutes ago. Um, let's say you had labels for your packages of carrot soup. If you had to retest and reprint every single time, the costs would become quite exorbitant. And so the Canadian Food Inspection Agency understands that there's going to be a reasonable amount of variation, but at the same time, they want to know What process did you go through and how reasonable is it for that label to be accurate? And so we have to think, does this product require a label? And are we going through a a process that is accurate? So I think this is, oh yes, this is the end of my slideshow. I am just going to jump out here. Uh, Let's just uh, see if I can get into the Food and Drugs Act now. Oh, see, the Food and Drugs Act is being closed down all day. It's Sunday, and it's Sunday afternoon, and I don't want to... I can send out my food product to a lab. I'm just pulling up SGS Canada as an example. I could take my food product, package it up, if it's a cold chain product or a... Um, A frozen product, I could package it with dry ice or with refrigeration packs and send it out to an analytical lab. And honestly, this is an important part of the analysis, that if I am sending it for chemical analysis, I want to send it to a lab that's accredited. And accreditation means that they have gone through an evaluation process to make sure that the methods that they're using are best in class and they're following extremely good quality laboratory analysis methods. SGS Canada, uh, SGS uh, is a global organization and they just happen to do some really good um, robust analysis. Just some, something that I'm looking for here is that it is ISO 17,025 accredited. And so their nutrition analysis is done in a space where they have ISO standards 
if I wanted to send my product to them for analysis, I would be contacting them, send them a message or calling them at this phone number. And I'd be able to quickly identify what the cost of analysis is going to be. And depending on, and, and again, it's variable depending on each product, but they would send me information saying, I, you just made carrot soup. It's a shelf stable product. Fantastic. Please mail us X number of packages. Maybe it's five packages. Maybe it's 10 packages. Depends on the statistical um, uh, repetitions necessary for that product. And I would mail it off to them and they would send me back a nutrition fact stable. And that's it. And they'd send me a bill, likely for about $1,500. But what we will notice in a moment is that more often, companies are going to be using database. And there's nothing wrong with it. We are going to take some time and learn how to use the database because it's an incredibly powerful tool. And it's something that once you, once you learn how to do it, you'll realize, whoa, this is pretty darn easy. So we've learned about why foods need nutrition facts tables and which foods need nutrition facts tables. And we've quickly learned if I needed to send it out for chemical analysis, how could I do that? In a moment, let's learn how to make some nutrition facts tables using a database. All right, that's enough for me for now. And I will talk to you again really soon.